Hey folks, it's Robin Robbins here, founder of technologymarketingtoolkit.com, and I've got something really special I want to share with you to say thank you during this week of Thanksgiving here in America. Now, I know I've got a lot of international clients, and um, you might not know that this week is Thanksgiving, and this is when most American families get together, and we remember what we are most grateful for. And one of the things that I am tremendously grateful for is my subscribers, my fans, my clients that are loyal to me, that, um, you know, that have been, been with me for a long time and some brand new. And it, without you, uh, my business wouldn't succeed. I wouldn't be where I am today. And I never lose sight of that. So as a way of giving back and saying thank you, I dug up out of the archives a video from boot camp that happened several years ago. And it's a speaker named, by the name of Robert Stevenson. And Robert wrote a couple books. He wrote a book called How to Soar Like an Eagle in a World Full of Turkeys. And he's got another book that's called Raise Your Line. And Robert's presentation is one that was a little bit of a surprise at how well it was received. Now, of course, we always hire speakers that we think are going to be fantastic. Um, but I got to tell you, Robert's presentation was above and beyond. People absolutely loved his stories, his insights, his strategies on customer service, on delivering excellence consistently, predictably. And I think you're going to love it too. So that's why I've put the full unedited version of his presentation up on the video blog as a way of just saying thanks to you, uh, my subscriber, my client, my friend, my follower, however you want to, uh, I guess, what, however you want to categorize, categorize yourself. Um, again, I am incredibly grateful and thankful for you um, I think IT services businesses are the unsung heroes of business. I think you are grossly underappreciated. I think um, people don't understand how damn difficult it is to run an IT services business and deliver the level of excellence that you deliver in a world where cyber threats are ever, ever increasing, where you've got so many complexities going on in a network, so many different apps, so many different users going, connecting to who knows what and going who knows where on the internet. I mean, it's a really, really difficult job. And I know you dedicate your life to serving, to helping, to uh, rescuing your customers, keeping them safe, keeping them productive, keeping them up and running. And again, I don't think you get enough appreciation for what you do. So just know if for what it's worth, this redhead, this company, we appreciate you. We know how hard you work, how dedicated you are, and how underappreciated you are. And so thank you for what you do for all entrepreneurs, all businesses in the world. Sincerely, honestly, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And just um, as a little give back or thanks, I thought you might enjoy this video and share it with your employees to inspire them, to motivate them, to help you raise the line, raise the level of excellence in your IT company, because I know that's what you want to do, don't we all? And it's not easy. So um, I hope this helps. And again, I want to thank you and wish you a very happy, blessed, healthy Thanksgiving uh, with your family, with your extended family, um, your clients, your employees. And uh, I hope it is, uh, this year has been as great for you as it has been for us. So now without any further ado, I'll shut up and here's Robert Stevenson. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Larry Walters story, but Larry Walters made the determination he wanted to fly. He didn't have a whole lot of money, didn't mind owning an airplane, but the guy decided he wanted to fly. So he got a great idea in his backyard in Los Angeles, California. He got a aluminum lawn chair, he got a seatbelt, he got two six-packs of beer, two peanut butter jelly sandwiches, a BB gun, a CB radio, and 45 helium balloons. He sits down as a aluminum launcher, he starts inflating the balloons. Now when he gets the 45th balloon inflated, what was the objective? To go 100, 200, 300 feet in the air? That was the objective, but not Larry. He went 11,000 feet above Los Angeles International Airport. In fact, the dude shut it down for six hours, which is illegal to do. We'll get in that in a moment. But can you imagine the Delta pilot says, you're not going to believe it. We got a guy up here at 11,000 feet, a aluminum lawn chair. <laughs> they sit in the airplane. He said, no, this fool's outside. They said, what's he doing? He says, he's talking to me on a CB radio. <laughs> in fact, I think he just popped a beer. <laughs> imagine being 11,000 feet above LAX going, how you doing, Delta? Good to be here, United. Well, hey, Southwest. Now, what was the BB gun for? 
shoot the balloons. Guy goes 11,000 feet above LAX, drinks a couple of six packs, takes out his BB gun, shoots the balloons, and lands safely. This is the true story. Now, it's illegal to do that, so the police were there and they arrested him. But the media was there and they said, You can't arrest him, this is neat, so they unarrested him. <laughs> they took him into the press conference. They said, What in the world were you doing? He said, I wanted to fly. They said, You glad you did? Absolutely, gonna do it again. He said, Are you nuts? He said, I just about killed myself. Why did I tell you the third story? He did it. He was determined to fly, folks, and you guys got to be determined to do what? Constantly improve all aspects of your organization. Question, how many people in here have folks that work for you? Show of hands. Silly question, but the critical one. If you're going to take your organization to the next level, you got to take them to the next level. See, I don't do business with companies. I do business with what? People. I want to convey a message to you that you can take back to them. You already understand what we've got to do as far as take them up. What I want to do is so you can go back to them to make them better at what they do, and the next thing you know, your organization gets better. Now, first of all, I'm going to give you a disclaimer. I'm not an expert in your industry. You guys are the experts in that, and you've got a whole lot of experts that have been on this stage that are going to be on this stage that are going to be sharing information about your industry. But I've had the opportunity over the last 20 years to deal with a few folks. I've worked with about 2,200 companies, and I've interviewed about 10,000 employees, managers, and senior executives about 200 different industries. I am not industry-specific, nor do I want to be. I don't do generic programs. I pick up the phone and call people, and I learn something when I do what? Shut up and listen. Same thing when you're out there selling to your client. You, gotta, you want to become successful in sales? By the way, quit selling. Quit selling, ladies and gentlemen, because just as soon as I find out that you're selling me something, I do what? Get nervous. Help me get what I need, and the next thing you know, all of a sudden, we're going to raise the bar. But I also understand we got to do what? we got a little competition out there. How many of y'all have any competitors? Show of hands. All right? I mean, what you've got to understand, by the way, some of them might be in this room. And let me give you a, a news bulletin. They don't like you. You might even shook their hands last night. Oh, how you doing? I wish you would go out of business, all right? <laughs> I mean, how many of y'all would like to be the only dog and pony show in your town doing what you do? Show of hands, okay? And that's what you've got to understand. All right, so when you look at it, when you start thinking about it, you have some amazing, incredible speakers that have spoken and are going to speak on this stage. And one of the problems that you have when you start thinking about something like this is you talk about an overload. I mean, look at the, the list of the people that are going to be talking to you about so many different subjects. And what you've got to understand is my statement to you is when you've got those, that many people talking about business, look for redundancy. Don't all of a sudden say, well, so-and-so said that. Say, I'm glad. All of a sudden, you got two people saying it, three people saying it, four people saying it. Next thing you know, when you've got three or four people saying it, what is it? Important. And that's what we've got to do. Understand how we can raise the bar and get better. Listen to them. And that's what you're starting to think about. So what in the world do I share with you that you haven't already heard in this meeting, the last meeting, and the other people are going to be talking? Well, let's start with a few questions. Question number one, do you still have to deal with customers who are sometimes tough, mean, and stubborn? Three, three-letter answer, real simple, all at the same time. One, two, three. Yes. Okay, not bad. You think about it. Do you have to deal with, deal with complaining people? Yes. Oh, I want to hear everybody. Let's rock it. Okay, better. Do you start looking at it? Do you sometimes have to deal with young, inexperienced employees? Yeah. Are we done? Oh, no, we got more. Do you wish your staff would appear to be a little bit more professional? Yeah. yeah, okay. It gets worse, folks. Do you sometimes feel like the little dog when you're dealing with what? Competitors. <laughs> yep. You got some of those big players out there, and then you have to deal with what? Are you tired of hearing them say, I don't see the value? I'm not believing you. Too busy to see you. Are we done? Oh, no, folks. What you've got to understand, you've got to do with finding good employees, keeping good employees, heavy workloads, interruption, demand my time, other, balancing work and personal life. Yeah. Do you sometimes do what? Feel a little frazzled? <laughs> Is that not a great picture? I saw the picture. I said, I've got to work that in and do a program, okay? And that's exactly the way we feel. See, I'm not a professional speaker as far as what I've done in the past. I've owned several companies. I learned a long time ago that you're dealing with your people and you're making a payroll and it's a whole different game. I remember one time I was doing a program for Georgia Tech and their entrepreneurial people that wanted to be in business for themselves. And we were doing a Q&A afterwards and I stopped and I said, let me ask you a question. You guys want to be entrepreneurs? Why? Young man raised his hand. Freedom. <laughs> Good. You ain't got a clue, son. All right. But you guys do. And that's what we talk about. We're going to deal with it. We're going to be frowsy, but that's what you've got to understand. I thought so. Some things never change. Let's talk about it. So I decided to share with you some things that I've learned from some of my clients. As I said, I don't do generic programs. 
I've had the opportunity to deal with a lot of companies and, and pick up the phone and call them and ask them about what they do and how they do. And I'm here to share some of that information so you can raise the bar. Get better at what you're going to do. And also, I don't do handouts. You're looking at your handout right there, and I looked down at it and I went, oh, shucks. It says 2006. The last time I did a handout was 2006. Robin called up and said, I want a handout. Don't do handouts. Robin's very persuasive. No, Rob, I need a handout. And it went on and on and on. I think you know that game, okay? And I said, okay, I'll do a handout, except I didn't change the template. So that's why you've got the stupid date in case you're wondering why in the world it's there. That's the last time I did a handout. I don't do them. One reason why, I do a lot of slides. For you that out there in sales, and by the way, how many people in this room are in sales? Show of hands. I hope you all raised your hand because if you didn't, you don't understand business. We're all in sales. But what I learned a long time ago is people are visual. And I use a lot of slides in my program because you hear what I say, but you internalize what you see. So let's start talking about the leadership formula. If you're going to lead your people, it's people, not procedures, action, not talk, desired, not required. It's showing, not shouting, flexible, not fixed, listening, not telling, caring, not bottom line. More importantly, it's want to, not have to. But what you've also got to understand, it is a process. It is not an event. What you have to appreciate, folks, is your people are watching you all the time. You're the person that sets the tone. I mean, all of a sudden, Robin walks up here and gets us doing what? Dancing, clapping, everything else. And what she said, they're, they're watching you. You walk into that office and you're tired, and what are they? They're tired. If you're up, they're up. And that's what you've got to understand. You are always on camera. So when you look at the process, my question to you, are you always passionate? Are you the great communicator? Are you fast, efficient, flexible, compassionate, and disciplined? More importantly, humble, curious, open-minded, attentive, focused, effective, determined. See, before you start grading your people, grade you. Because you're the person that's going to do what? Set the tone, establish the culture, and make the organization better. You're the leader. So when you look at it, do you discuss the objectives? Do you resolve the conflicts? Do you make what? Objectives clear? Do you have high energy? You look at it, process, you know, ergonomics. You've seen the list, it's in your book. But when you start thinking about how you're starting to grade your people, the first thing you have got to do is grade you. You've heard the example, but I'll share it again. When your people make a mistake, it's easy to blame them. You did it. You did it. You did it. My mentor taught me this. One goes out, three come back. The first thing you need to say when your people fail is, what have I done to cause them to fail? And then all of a sudden things start to change. And that's what we got to identify right here. The fast track of success is very simply this. The great employees that you have come from who? The great leaders. You. You set the precedent. That's why I want to share a message that you can take back with them to make them better. One of my books is 52 Essential Habits for Success. Why did I write it? Well, one reason why is I, I, I wanted to kind of identify the simple things. Every self-help book that I've read and, and people out there, it's, how many of y'all are familiar with Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? I've worked with Stephen. He is an amazing, brilliant man. But when you look at the book, people have asked me, how should I use the book? And I said, read one chapter, put it down. They said, for a month. Why? There's so much in one chapter. But a lot of times when people start reading all these self-help books, they look at it and they go, oh, I've got to sit down and put a list of what I'm doing wrong and doing right and doing this and doing that. And pretty, pretty soon you just finally go, oh, I give up. I'll just be average. I just don't want to do this anymore. So I just want to make it simple. So I, I, I sent out an email to a bunch of people and I said, tell me the top 10 things you need to do to be successful. I got back a bunch of lists and I started looking at them. Three and four kind of everybody agreed with and there was a new one. Then there was another new one. Then there was another new one. And then I said to myself, this is interesting. Let's send out some more and send out some more and start putting it together. So they say if you do something 14 to 21 times, it becomes a habit. So I decided instead of telling you to put together a list and assess yourself and do this and do that, just give you the rule. Give you the stupid rule, the habit that you need to have. And put it in a 20 font and put it on one page. Hardest book I ever had to read. I mean, right. Why? I mean, I'm a speaker, folks. I can talk about a subject forever. But I had to put it on one page so you get the point. And then all of a sudden, you just do what? Tape it on a mirror, brush your teeth, and read it twice a day. At the end of the week, tear it down and put up another one. I've got companies that are putting them all over their bathrooms and doing what? Having their people read it to get an understanding of the habit. Don't need to assess yourself. Just learn the habit. And the next thing you know, it becomes what? Part of your subconscious. And by the way, your subconscious works 30,000 times faster than your conscious it becomes a part of you so what are you trying to do my statement is get your people better that's exactly what we're looking for but those are the habits of what 
Those are the habits of a personal basis. My question to you is when you started thinking about ensuring your habits, what about the things that you do wrong? How many people in this room have made a mistake? Show of hands. How many have made it twice? Notice I didn't take my hand down, okay? When you start looking at the habits, think about the things that you're doing wrong. I called them foobars, fouled up beyond all repair. I mean, we've made a bunch of them. I mean, your name, sir, is Scott. I hire Scott. Good to meet you, Scott. I hire Scott. The first thing that I do is I go get the foobar list. I walk up to Scott and say, Scott, I'd like you to read this list. We've already made these mistakes. We don't need you to make them bubble. We'd like you to go make some new ones. <laughs> but it's amazing how many companies don't have that list. When you think about some of the standard mistakes that you make, we make them all the time. And the next thing you know, you have a new hire and you forgot to share that information. My statement is start writing them down. You get that new hire, here you go. Go look. To, to me, the first time is what? A learning experience. Second time is stupid. All right, so write them down. Well, let me give you some examples as far as food bars are concerned. I was doing a program in Cancun, about 250 executives that manage large skyscrapers. We're down there, and I said, somebody give me a food bar. Guy raised his hand. He said, I got this 100-story building in downtown New York. I said, okay. He said, we bought these new containers, and we mismarked them. One night, we filled the soap dispensers in every restroom with white latex paint. I said, you have got to be kidding me. He said, oh, no. I said, now, and he said, in defense of the idiot that did it, white soap, white paint looked about the same. But get a visual the next morning, a hundred-story building. People are down there going, this is some serious soap. <laughs> Will it, come, it won't come off my hand. Will it come, no, it won't come off my hand. He said, my phone rang off the hook. I said, has anybody got anything worse than that? Guy instantly raised his hand. He said, that's nothing. 250 executives went, that's nothing? He said, my people clean the toilet seat tops with phosphoric acid. He said, you don't want to go there. We put rashes in very bad places. And when you start thinking about all the mistakes that are out there, folks, they're out there. Smart people learn from their mistakes. Wise people learn from others. Oops, what happened? We've said that? Oh, cell phone? Okay, Ca camera guy? Oh, he's okay. All right, leave him alone. He's okay, all right? It happens, all right? When you start looking, oh, by the way, who was the guy that cell phone went off? Are you? All right, I won't, I won't, here. I had this book called How to Soar Like an Eagle in a World Full of Turkeys. Okay, this is yours. Free of charge. You gave $100, we'll give you a book, okay? Here you go. All right, let's start talking about, we learn from other, why do you think you're here? I mean, all of a sudden, you're doing what? Sharing information. And the more information that you share, the better that you get. And that's what you've got to understand. To talk to your peers, your socials, your confidants about things that you're doing right. Also, things that you're doing wrong. And then some of the questions can be resolved by one simple question. What if? See, I've asked that a lot of times. I made business decisions, I try to share that with my son. I said, if you're trying to make a decision, ask the question. What if this happens? And what if this happens? And what if this happens? I mean, think about Japan. Are we ready for an earthquake? Yeah. What if we get a tsunami with it? Uh, okay. What if we get a you know, nuclear fallout? It's like, you've got to be kidding me. What ifs? Well, you start looking at what ifs, ladies and gentlemen, in your business. Because that's where you all of a sudden drop the ball. You don't think so? Nice apartment building, huh? Whole bunch of them. They decided to do what? When they built those apartment buildings, they decided to build a garage underneath after it was built. Oh, yeah. Let's dig the dirt out, set it up on the side. That's what the plan was. Someone forgot to ask the question, what if it rains? Well, darn if it didn't rain. It started to rain, folks, and all of a sudden we had water seeping into the ground where they were digging it out. Began to shift, concrete piling snapped due to lateral pressures that were uneven. The building began to tilt. Building began to tilt, heck, the building fell. You're going, oh, Rob, that's a real nice drawing. Oh, yeah, let's get real world. There it is. How would you like to be the supervisor? Your boss calls up, how are things going? Building fell. <laughs> what, what do you mean what fell in the building? Oh, no, sir, the whole building, it's on the face, you know, down. You got to be kidding me. I mean, take a look at that. The entire building fell. It gets worse, folks. Look at the concrete pilings that snapped. And my favorite statement of all, the gentleman said, the crew in charge promised to be more careful in the next building. <laughs> well, yee-haw, okay? I and mean, isn't that exciting? But you know what? When your customer's computer crashes, it's just about as bad. All of a sudden, they're saying to myself, oh my goodness gracious, what if? See, you know when you go in and you're selling people, don't go in and sell. Just ask what if questions. 
What if this happens? What if that happens? What if you, you, you do what? There's this thing called spin selling, situation, problem, implication, need. What are you trying to do? Make them bleed. Because a lot of times they don't know it until it happens and then they weren't ready. But you do. Because you can share with them all the things that you've learned from your clients. You don't think it can happen, folks? Let's start talking about a very prestigious company. Only been in business for 233 years. Her Majesty the Queen was a client. One person does what? Invest 1.3 billion euros in the futures market and loses them all. The company's gone, folks. 233 years, the company is gone. One person, all the backup plans failed. All the people that were supposed to do what they were doing failed. And all of a sudden, you got a company that's gone and 1,000 employees are no longer employed. You start looking at your company the same way you look at their company. And by the way, the moment you quit thinking about their company as somebody as a client and you make them part of your organization will be the moment you start succeeding. Because that's what they're looking for. Someone that's going to protect them from the what ifs. Welcome to the game, ladies and gentlemen. By the way, I call business a game because if you know how to play it, you will win. And that's what we're talking about. Learn from your mistakes. And by the way, share the knowledge. Share as much knowledge as you can with your people so you don't make it the second time. You've already paid the price once. 90% of management consists of making it difficult for people to get things done. All right? Peter Drucker. You know what I used to do? Hire the right people and then get out of their way. I call it a rocket on a string. Let them run and every once in a while you got to pull it back. But let, get out of their way and let them do their jobs and make them feel important. That's what it's about, folks. And that's what you've got to appreciate. When sharing the information and suggestions, don't forget the details. I mean, all of a sudden, um, Alex, how long have you been doing this? Nine years. So what do I do? Oh, Alex has been doing this for nine years. We've got this new thing going on. I don't need to give you all the information. You got it, man. You're smart. All right. And what do I do? Forget to share the details. And that's when you make the mistake. Because a lot of times you're assuming that they understand that they don't. Share that information with your people and also your clients. You don't think so? Here's the example. As the story goes, scientists develop a gun to launch chickens at the windshield of military jets and space shuttles to do what? Test the windshield on the ground. If you're up there flying in the sky and you fly into the bird and the windshield cracks, people die. That's not good. So they came up with this wonderful gun. Shoot, get, stick a chicken in there, shoot it at the windshield. Did it break? No. Good. Let's go fly. In fact, it worked so good, some of our allies heard about it. British engineers called us up and said, we'd like to test it on our high-speed trains. We said, not a problem. You're our ally. So we sent them the gun and we sent them directions. And they shot their chicken and stood there in shock. What did their chicken do? Crash through the shadowproof shield. Smashed it to smithereens, crashed through the control console. Snapped the train engineer's back rested to and bedded itself on the back wall of the cabin. That's not the plan, folks. They sent the disastrous results back. They said, this is what we did, the way we did it, how we did it. We need your help. Scientists reviewed everything and then they understood the mistake. They sent them a one sentence response, a very simple sentence. They told them to do what? Thaw the chicken. Folks, that's been out there a long time. Why do I keep it in there? Because it makes sense. If you've heard it, it doesn't matter because what you've got to appreciate is when you take the chicken out of the freezer, they call that a projectile. <laughs> See, that's a minor detail. No, it's not. So all of a sudden you're sitting there saying, let's do that. So when you look at sharing examples with your people, all we would do is go, thaw the chicken. Oh, share that information. You didn't follow the chicken. Oh, good point. And the next thing you know, your people start to appreciate it because they do what? Put it back to a story. Then they understand and appreciate why you're telling them something. Because a lot of times when you tell your employees things, it's like, oh, you're just telling me. You're the boss. You're just telling me. You're the boss. You're just telling me. No, give them a story behind it. Give them the reasons why. And now all of a sudden we start appreciating what's going on. By the way, you can't control any of these things. So what you need to do is quit worrying about them. They're going to happen. You're going to happen. And what you've got to appreciate when you start looking at the economy, oh, the economy is terrible. Folks, we have a very large economy. So how do you do business? If you can't find them, take away from your competitors. That's what you've got to understand because there's people still doing business out there and you've got to appreciate it. So start worrying about the things that you can control. These are things that are in your possession, things that you can do from the advertising campaigns and the materials from branding, delivering systems, all the way down to who? You. Those are the things that you can control. But you know what's so excited about this room right here? It's a fact that the marketing stuff's already been done for you. You don't have to go and reinvent the wheel. The wheel's what? Been invented. Go do something else that you're better at. Take advantage of what's going on, but what we don't do is follow systems. And that's one of the biggest mistakes we make. See, it's imperative for your people to do what? Understand what they need to change. Understand why the need for continuance and improvement. Understand why constant training and new ideas. We forget to tell them why. 
They don't get caught up in it. You do, they don't. And by the way, this is what we, let me, I'm, I'm going to segue real quick because this is really important. When you start thinking about hiring people, Nordstrom's has 10 different people interview somebody before they hire them. We all see different things. When you hire someone, ladies and gentlemen, they've got to understand the culture. If it is a job to them, don't hire them. If it is a career, hire them. What do I want? The person that wants to do what? Take my job. Now, all of a sudden, we're going to do what to the company? Raise the bar. We're going to get better at what we do, and that's what we're looking for. Because they say if you do what you've always done, you get what you've always got, and that's not right in this competitive business environment today. Take a look at the 100 largest companies that exist in the United States in the 1900s. 16 are still in existence. 230 of the Fortune 500 companies that existed in 1980 are gone. 46% of the perennial leaders, you go back 10 more years, that number jumps to 74%. All of a sudden you say, gosh, we're big, we're great, we're fantastic. We've been doing this nine years, we've been doing it 15, we've been doing it 20. We'll always be around. Oh, really? Folks, let's start talking about the big ones. The 100 most valuable companies in the United States from 1985 to 2000. The top players how'd they do from 85 to 90 24 got pushed off the list from 90 to 95 26 got pushed off the list from 95 to 2000 41 got pushed off the list it adds up to what 91 players got pushed off the list don't tell me how big you are how great you are how fantastic you are tell me what you're going to do for me tomorrow being an ex-athlete taught me a lot of important things about business i didn't appreciate the, at the time one thing it taught me is i'm only as good as my next game my last game will get me on the court, but the moment I start dropping the ball and missing the shot, you know what they say? You're out of here. What you've got to understand about corporate America today is loyalty's gone. The moment you drop the ball, they're going to be picking up the phone calling somebody else, and they will not even call you. And you're going to say, why didn't you give us the opportunity to fix it? You should have called and found out it was working okay, <clears throat> but we don't do that. And that's my concern, folks. How would you like to have your picture on the cover of more Fortune magazine? They call you a dinosaur. And those are major players, a dinosaur. IBM went from 475,000 employees to less than 200,000 employees in a couple of years. A couple of guys in a garage changed the industry. But their attitude was, we're big blue, we're great, we're fantastic. They'll always do business with us. And by the way, they were good. In the 60s, they only had an 82% worldwide market share. In the 80s, Fortune magazine called them the most admired corporation four years in a row. In the 90s, $15 billion in cumulative losses over three years. Their market capitalization went from $105 billion to $32 billion. They almost didn't survive. And why do I use IBM? To take a shot at them? Heck no. And then they sat down and they took a look at what was going on, and they changed. And you know what's even more interesting? They brought in an outsider. They brought in an outsider who didn't know the computer business. And, they, and, and, and corporate America and Wall Street thought they'd lost their mind. And for the next three months, he never made a press conference. He never talked to anybody except his people to find out what made them great. And then he took them back to greatness. So you get an understanding of what's going on here, folks. What you've got to appreciate is it happens. We used to hand that out to our people every year. We say, take a look at the top 500. Oh, no, don't look at the ones that are on there. Look at the ones that no longer are on there. Why? How did it get taken away from them? When you're starting to drive your people, they have to have an appreciation of why you're driving them. Why the need for constant improvement? Then they have an appreciation. One of the things I loved yesterday and, and just felt the enormous pain was a lady that was standing up here talking and she started to cry. And then she stopped and then she started again. And then she stopped and she started again. And all that told me is she's lived it. She's been there. She understands the pressure. But her people don't. And that's what you've got to appreciate. You start bringing them together because, by the way, they are your family. One reason why, they're with you. More than you're probably with your family when you start looking at how much you're doing. So create that family environment. And then you have an appreciation. And then what made her feel great? was the fact that all of a sudden she listed her problems to everybody else, and they looked at that and went, oh, this is it? <laughs> that ain't a problem. We've been there. We got that. We can fix that. Really? Yeah, just follow this plan. But you know what the biggest problem is in America today, worldwide today? You give somebody the plan, and they won't follow the plan. That's what's really interesting. You take a look at what's the difference in the rope and not the rope, the people that are doing it not doing it, following the plan. Oh, I can't do that. Let me tell you something. You've been here, and all of a sudden you, did, and you made that leap of faith. And then someone says, write that check, and I'll show you how to do it. And you're saying, write that check? Your accountant says, we don't have that money. I can't write that check. 
But then all of a sudden you figure out, if I don't, I won't be here. The next thing you know, someone says, here, this is how we do it. Follow that trail. And the next thing you know, you're getting better at what you're doing. And that's what you've got to appreciate. Go do something else. Go sell. The marketing's been designed. They've already figured it out. They've already proved it. The game, ladies and gentlemen, is what we're trying to do. How fast can it go away from you? Look at the Fortune 500, I mean, Fortune companies, the top ones. In 1960, 2011, one is still on the list. That's what you've got to appreciate. So even with the big boys, they're scared to death about how they're going to do it. You've got to understand, and so do your people, that future success is not inevitable because of past triumphs. You're graded every day, hero to zero every day. You want to find out how good your company is? Call it. Call your company and find out how long it takes to get somebody on the phone who's got a smile on their face, who's got an answer. Call it. No, let's put them on voicemail. Let's not call it. Let's not answer. And then all of a sudden, if you don't answer, what if I need you on a Saturday at 8 o'clock when my stuff goes down? You said you were available 24-7, but I can't reach anybody. Find out how good you are, call it. and Start grading yourself. That's what we're worried about. We've got to do what? Understand that success is never final. Then we start getting better. Better, folks? I love Andy Grove. He said only the paranoids survive. Paranoids believe someone or some force is out to get them. I was always going, here they come, here they come, here they come, they're coming. Trying to take it away from it, and you appreciate that. That's what she was doing on this stage. All of a sudden sharing her heart and soul that I had these problems. We all had them. That's what I, in my business you have a lot of people that come up here and talk. I call them professional entertainers. If you did a Q&A with them, they wouldn't have a clue. They got a nice stick. But have they run a business? Have they made a payroll? Have they lived your life? And then all of a sudden you have an appreciation for when everybody gets paid before who? You. Now we understand the game. That's what we're trying to understand because just when you think you're good, by the way, I'm the one on the right. <laughs> Making sure you're paying attention, okay? Just when you think you're good, someone comes along better. And that's what happens in corporate America today. I mean, I want to find out how good you are. I go to your website, I look at all the things you say, and then I tweak mine and make mine two or three things better instantly. Just like that. You're going, you got to be kidding. That's why you're always raising the bar. So how do you do it? You now understand how to market it. My statement is then it's going to do what? Now you got to treat the customer special. Oh, yeah, we've heard that before. Well, let me share a story with you. One of my clients is the largest commercial real estate company in the world. They brought in about 500 of their top people. I interviewed the top 10, got to number one. I said, tell me how you became number one at what you did among all these people. He said, Rob, I got lucky very early in my career. Really? He said, yeah, a guy drove up to my place in an old car, got out wearing jeans, T-shirt, Doc Siders, didn't have a briefcase, didn't have a watch on, nothing, just walked in. Walked in and said, I'd like to lease 500 square feet. 500 square feet to a commercial realtor is someone calling you up with a laptop computer and asking you to come to their house and program it for them. Oh, shucks, let's just rush. This is exciting. How many do you have? I have two laptops in my company. Yay! So what do you do? You just pass it off. Oh, that's not a big customer. That's not a this. That's not a that. I said, what'd you do? He said, I spent four hours with him. I said, doing what? He said, well, I asked him, why do you want the 500 square feet? You starting a new company? Well, yeah. Well, sir, if you start a new company and you're successful and you expand, you need room for expansion here. If you don't have room for expansion here, you got to do what? Move. Then you got cost for moving, cost for what? Printing, cost for new phone lines and this and that. He said, I took my years and years and years of experience to help this gentleman. And after four hours, he had the audacity to get up and leave. Didn't lease a thing. Didn't lease a thing, ladies and gentlemen. That 500 square feet was no big deal. He said, but the next day he drove up. He wasn't in that old car. He drove up in that Mercedes 500S, got out in his $1,500 suit, wearing his Submariner and a Rolex and his alligator briefcase. Walked into my place and took out a business card and handed it to me. He said, I'm from Coca-Cola. He said, I don't need 500 square feet. He said, right now I need 50,000. He said, but when it's all said and done, we're going to need over a million. We're doing some new relocation. And I was blown away. I said, oh, come on, man. I said, why in the world did you spend five, I mean, four hours with this guy? He said, Rob, I had nothing else to do. <laughs> he said, the stupid phone didn't ring because of it. And he said, I just said, shoot, get the heck out of here. He said, if somebody more important walked in, I just said, get out of here, which would have been basically anybody. He said, it's the greatest thing that ever happened to my business. Why? Because you don't know who they know. All of a sudden, they pick up the phone, and they call their mother, their dad, their brother, their aunt, their uncle, and say, gosh, I had this problem. I called this company, and boy, were they so helpful. And they didn't charge me for this and that. They just said, you know, that's okay. We'll take care of this. We'll get this down, and, and when you, when you, we'll help you grow. By the way, as they're growing, you can grow with them. And then the next thing you know, they're sharing that information, and all of a sudden, people are doing what? Hiring you guys, and I'll segue. 
Several years later, I'm doing a program for people that large, manufacture large 18-wheelers. Why do I segue? They got an order from Coca-Cola for 100 trucks after their competitor dropped the ball. Their competitor beat them on the bid. Competitor beat them on the bid. Coke said, okay, build us one. We'll take a look at it. Then you can do the other 99. So they put the jigs together and the molds and the dies and all the new chrome and all the new graphics on the truck. And they built this fantastic new 18-wheeler and they drove it down to Atlanta, Georgia. The hierarchy walks down there and the, and the chairman of the board reaches up, opens the cab door. Anybody like to tell me what's on the dash? A Pepsi can. Ah! <laughs> uh, a Pepsi can. He looks at the Pepsi can. He slams the door. He says, get that truck off my property. I own that one. Cancel the other 99. If it had been my driver, he'd been wearing a Coca-Cola uniform. Heck, you can buy them online. He'd had that baseball cap that you put the beer cans in with the straws, except he'd had Coke cans driving in. We just love your stuff. No, let's don't pay attention to the details, folks. And the next thing you know, we lose the client. And that's what you've got to appreciate. You treat everybody special. And the next thing you know, your company is surviving. Your company is growing. You're getting bigger. Within your organization, and by the way, the same as your people, because there's a rule in business. As you treat your employees, they will treat your customers. Don't ever forget that. That's what you've got to appreciate. All of a sudden, you start treating them special, and they'll start treating customers special. You create that culture, and they'll create that culture. But you understand you don't know who they know, and appreciate the fact that someone might be shopping you just to see if you'll go above and beyond. How many of y'all have seen Apollo 13? Great movie. By the way, if you haven't, get it. And by the way, share it with your people. Why do I share this with you? You start looking at what's going on as far as problems in the economy and everything else. And what I loved about it is the next thing you know, we got people who are going to die. What I loved about the movie, when you looked at it, they didn't think that they would ever return to Earth in the lunar module. So all of a sudden, when things didn't work and the scrubbers didn't work and you couldn't get the carbon dioxide out of the air, they had a problem and they couldn't switch it from one to the other. So the engineer walked in there, and I, I love this part. He took a box and he threw the stuff on the table and said, that's all that's in the module. We got to make a scrubber or they die. And all of a sudden you get an understanding of what's going on. Dying was not an option. Not an option, ladies and gentlemen. They made that stupid scrubber right there. In this highly competitive business environment, if you're going to survive, you can't do it. One of the biggest problems you have as an owner, as an entrepreneur, as a person that owns that company is delegating. You can't always do it yourself. You've got to release it, give it to your people. That's why your people are so critical in doing it. They refuse to happen. Those three men would not be here unless those engineers all of a sudden said, we're going to get it done. And that taught me a lot of things about business, folks. They, collectively, your people will fight this war with you if you get them involved and treat them special. I love the thing that Robin had as far as bringing them together. You take a look at that right there, 14 seconds. 14 seconds, folks, they're going to change four tires. They're going to put gasoline in there. They're going to feed and hydrate that driver. One person drops one lug nut, and they lose. One of my clients writes a software for them. Writes a software for them where they analyze 6,000 things per second on that race car to make sure it's right. You start getting an understanding of what's going on. That's how your company runs. So what do we do? It's a team. You're going, oh, another speaker is going to say team. Team, 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 team. What in God's name can I say about team that you are, have, haven't already heard? Probably nothing, except that's the way you're going to win. See, that's what it's about. When you get them involved with each other, sharing the information, when they all of a sudden they take a look at the company as it's their own, then you will start succeeding. So you've got to do what? Make them feel special about it. It can't be just yours. The book, Good to Great, has been out for years. But why do I share the information? Because they analyzed 1,435 of the largest companies in America to find out what made them great. They had an interesting criteria. Number one, they had to be in business a minimum of 30 years. And in that 30 years, over 15 years, they had to beat the stock market by three times the market. And this was before the last great crash. 11 made the cut. 11 made the cut. Who are the players that made the cut? 3M, Boeing, Intel, Coca-Cola, Disney, Walmart, GE? Didn't. See, when I heard that list and they didn't mean I said, okay, now I'm going to read that book. I'm going to read that book, folks. They're the players that made the cut. And it's not important who made the cut. It's important how they made the cut. And by the way, I love leaving that on there. Look at Circuit City. <laughs> Look at Circuit City. By the way, they were the best. Everybody's talking how great they were. And you know what happened? Circuit City, I love this. Circuit City was taking a look at their bottom line, and they said, you know, we're paying our smart salespeople too much. 
So they fired 3,500 of their most intelligent salespeople who were giving answers to the consumers who were walking in saying, I don't understand this. And they said, no, we'll just put an idiot in there to hand them the stupid, what? Electronics. And they crashed and burned. They crashed and burned. So you get an understanding of what's going on. It can change for any of them. They focused on what to do, what not to do, but more importantly, what to stop doing. If you can't be number one at it, don't be it. That doesn't mean the largest in sales volume. It means whatever you're doing, do it better than your competition. That's what you've got to appreciate. How can we do it? And they also found out that people were not the greatest asset. The greatest asset was the right people. Before I read this book, I traveled around the world telling companies, associations, and organizations their greatest asset was their people. They had the audacity to tell me I was wrong. I actually read the book with a chip on my shoulder. Yeah, right. Prove it. And they did. Their analogy was this. You've got to get the right ones on the bus and the wrong ones off. The wrong ones, ladies and gentlemen, right now you can close your eyes and you can visualize the people back at, back at your company that are the right ones, can't you? You can see them right now, the ones you can count on all the time. But you know what's scary? You can also close your eyes and visualize the wrong ones, can't you? You're saying to yourself right now, why in the world did I hire them? They were breathing at the time, okay? And you needed to fill that spot. The worst thing that you could ever do is fill that spot with the wrong person because they're going to cost you a customer. And that's what you've got to appreciate. We've got to get the right ones out there. And by the way, in this time out there in the marketplace, there are a lot of them looking for jobs, so start getting the right ones. What do you need? People with unwavering resolve. Settle for nothing less than number one. When times are bad, things are poor. Results are what? In that mirror, folks. That's what you need to blame, the mirror. As I said, you point that finger out, no, point that finger to here. By the way, how do you get rid of those people? Simple, fire them. You're going, oh, that makes a lot of sense, Rob. There's 740,000 attorneys in the United States today. You know, they love that statement, fire them. No, you don't have to fire them. Your people will. When you start setting up a culture in your organization, someone starts sloughing off, you know what they say? Why don't you get on out of here? You're going to affect my job. You're not doing it. Why don't you just get on the heck out of here? Your people will start protecting your organization, and then you will grow. That's the culture you need to set up. That's how you're going to be great. Discipline people, thought, and action. It starts with who? You. That's the hard part of it. It starts with you. You're always being graded and don't forget it about it. Where do you want to be 10 years from now? All of a sudden, we got some people sitting in the back of that room right there, and you're saying, there's no way I could be that big. There's no way I could do that much. There's no way I could have that many people. My statement is wrong. Where do you want to be 10 years from now? Starbucks went from zip to 1.7 billion in 5,000 locations in 10 years. One of my favorites, Telepizza. You probably never heard of it in Spain. Telepizza, 2 billion enterprise. 1,000 restaurant locations, you're going, who the heck is Telepizza? Let's do this story, folks. Johnson & Johnson, guy was working for him in, in Spain, decides he doesn't want to do that anymore. Goes to his wife and says, we're going to be in the pizza business. We're going to do what? I'm going to take our life savings and build a restaurant, a pizza restaurant. We're going to do what? We're going to go up against Pizza Hut and Domino's. We're going to do what? Oh, yeah, that's a great idea, and that's what he did. He built one restaurant, and then he started selling pizza. Uh-uh. You put a sign up. When it's the best pizza in Spain, then you can pay me for it. People thought it was a gimmick. They'd walk in there and they'd eat it, and he said, no, it's free. Then all of a sudden someone said, well, this is the best pizza in Spain. Pay me. All right. All of a sudden the attitude changed. You think that's ridiculous? No, that's not ridiculous, folks. How good did they get? Oh, let's see. Pizza Hut went bankrupt. 1,000 locations, and you get an understanding of what's going on. And by the way, the franchisees, people that would, that would go open up and do the things, all of a sudden they would have a problem. Someone would have a problem, they'd call corporate. They said, that's not working. That's not working. They said, okay, you're going to release control? Well, you called us and said, it's not working. You're not making the money you need to make? Right. Are you going to release control? Yeah. And they'd send out a crew. They'd send out a crew, and they would run it according to the manual. They'd run it according to the manual. Are you, when you answer the phone, are you saying you want extra cheese? Well, we don't say that every time. Oh, really? You're supposed to say it every time. Why? You make an extra buck here. Are you sending out the flyers? Are you doing this? Are you doing that? Robert can stand up here and talk to you. She's blue in the face. But if you don't do it, it doesn't work. You can have all the books in the world in your library until you read them. 90% of the books that are out there that are bought are never read. Oh, great intentions, don't follow the plan. Doesn't work, folks. It's called implementation. And that's what you've got to understand. And the next thing you know, someone goes from zip to what? A billion in sales? You've got to be kidding me. Robin took me from a break and fix company to a company that was recurring revenue. Really? All of a sudden, Robin increased my income by 92% in a down economy. Really? All of a sudden, you look at it. It wasn't, Robin, I wouldn't be in business at this point. See, I do my homework, folks. 
I can work for a lot of companies. I can turn down a lot of engagements. And that's, and that's something that I take advantage of. But I don't want to deal with someone that's not walking the talk. Go find them out. I, what did I do? I Googled, give me bad stuff about her. That's annoying. I didn't get any. All right. I like some of the dirt. But it's out there, and that's what you're looking for. You get an understanding. We were struggling. We had a lot of debt. We never knew where the next client was coming from. Not anymore. We followed the plan, and that was the key words. We followed the plan, folks. You can be sitting back there and say, well, I'll do it, but I'm not going to do all of it. Okay, then why waste your time? Follow it, folks. See, where do you want to be 10 years from now? That's my question to you. Real simple. When you get an understanding of that, you don't need to have the marketing person. That's been done for it. That would be exciting to me. Now I can do what? go sell. Now I can go out there and teach my people. Now I can be involved with my clients. That's what I want to do right here, folks. That's what we're looking for. I love that statement. Sales isn't magical, and that's exactly correct. It's truly a step-by-step -step process that anyone can learn. You want the greatest things in sales? Let me teach you one thing. I'll just segue for a second. When your people are on the phone, they're doing what? Smiling. When they're walking into a room, they're smiling. It's the first thing that you ever learn, but we don't do it. We don't walk up and shake someone's hand with a big smile. Oh, how you doing? Good to meet you. You know, I'm in such and such a computer company. I'm here to fix your stuff. Yay. All right. I want you to make me relax. Get the gatekeeper down so I feel better about what I'm doing. That's my concern, and that's what you've got to appreciate. When you look at it, you've got to execute flawlessly in every aspect of what you do, or it doesn't happen. And it starts with you. It starts with you, folks. Who's the most profitable airline in America today? Southwest. And then, folks, this is something I know a little bit about. I'm on 300 airplanes a year. Delta went bankrupt, United went bankrupt, US Air went bankrupt. They made a profit for every quarter for 30 years except one quarter, and then the next quarter they made it again. Number one criteria for getting hired at Southwest. Anybody know what it is? Yeah. Wonderful. Close. They take it one step further. Sense of humor. Say, what? I mean, all of a sudden you're getting ready to hire somebody. How's your sense of humor? What? What do you mean, how's my sense of humor? I got 20 years in computers, I can fix anything. But do you have a good sense of humor? How many of y'all have ever hired a jerk? <laughs> How many of y'all have ever worked for one? How many of y'all are one? Don't go there, okay? <laughs> I mean, when you start thinking about jerks, I mean, they're terrible. But when you look at it, they hire a sense of humor. Why? Well, they found out, you started looking at it, it's a number of criteria for being there. But when you look at a sense of humor, thrive during change. Remain creative under pressure. Work more effectively, play more enthusiastically, stay healthier in the process, and they share the stories. As I said, I'm on 300 planes a year. What do they do every time? Ladies and gentlemen, if we get into turbulence, this thing's going to come down, put it on your face, and breathe. I've heard it a million times. I'm on Southwest. The plane's not moving. Stuart walks up to the front, grabs the microphone, turns around, he goes, Folks, if we get into turbulence, not cool. <laughs> he said, This plastic doohickey thing's going to fall down. He says, Put it on your face and suck. He said, if you're traveling with a child, put it on your face and then put it on theirs. He said, if you're traveling with two children, put it on your face and then decide which one you love the most. <laughs> I mean, the airplane is cracking up, okay? And then they got this little petite stewardess, and she wants, to, she wants to do something fun. So she's thinking, she says, put me in the overhead. They said, what? She said, put me in the overhead. They went, okay. So they picked her up, and they put her in the overhead and shut it. And here comes the cattle call from Southwest. People walking down the aisle. Guy gets to a seat. He opens it up and goes, God! <laughs> she looks down. She says, can I help you with your bag? <laughs> I mean, they share these stories. And you say, you have got to be nuts. My number one salesperson in, my, in any business I've ever owned wore costumes. <laughs> she, every holiday. She had a, every holiday, she loves Halloween. Halloween was a, was a no-brainer. But 4th of July, she's in a costume, all right? I mean, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, she, she, and people were looking forward to Gail coming in. She was amazing. Had fun all the time. All the time, and you create that environment, folks. It starts with you. So when you sit there and say, do you have a sense of humor? No, don't hire them. Example, all of a sudden, you're getting, you're, they're getting ready to hire somebody at Southwest, a bunch of pilots. They get down to the final cut, and they ask them this question. By the way, this situation just happened. How would you handle that on a humorous basis? What do you mean a humorous basis? I got 40,000 hours in the air. I'm a military pilot. I've landed on aircraft carriers in 40-foot waves. I've been shot at in wars. I don't know how to handle something on a humorous basis. I land the jet safe. And they'll say next. Why? Because they can get a pilot who will do both. You say, you got to be kidding me. Uh-uh, folks. 
it's tough out there. There's a lot of work going on. So lighten up. Have some fun. And by the way, if you don't have a sense of humor, get one. <laughs> lighten up. Have a little fun here, folks. That's what we're looking at. And by the way, you'll, you're going to love this. This might be totally illegal. Okay? But we would hand people this list. I mean, you're getting ready to hire somebody. We'd sit there and say, energetic, happy, upbeat, knowledgeable, prompt, careful, cheerful, pleasant, fast, efficient, friendly. Are you what? Cordial, attentive, kind, go-getter, accommodating, gracious, professional, polite, courteous, helpful. We would hand them the list and we'd say, which ones aren't you? You would be amazed how many people would start checking. <laughs> oh, I'm not that, and I'm not that, and I'm not that. You want to hand them a dollar and say, here's a dollar, go buy a clue. You don't have one. <laughs> you're an idiot all right but you're sitting there and you're saying really well how many of y'all want that i do why not so you get an understanding but my question is how many of you are that which ones aren't you now all of a sudden you understand why the culture is not what you want because you got the right people in the right places things tend to stay in balance one of my clients shay home 95 percent of the time we hire people based on experience 95 percent of the time we fire them based on behavior Behavior, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to be kidding me. And you're sitting there and you've been there. She talked about the people that left. She talked about the people she had to let go. She talked about the people that she had to fire. We hired the wrong ones. And it's going to happen. I've been there and done that too. And by the way, let me share something with you. If I ever do a strategic planning session for corporations, and I'll be sitting there with a bunch of CEOs, I'll ask them this question. If you don't know this answer, you're not in the game. And the question is very simple. What's your turnover ratio? What's your turnover ratio compared to industry averages? Because if it's above that, why? See, that's what you've got to understand. You, you spend a lot of money training people that might not be on your bottom line. It's what? It's you, Alex, spending time. You're worth a fortune, okay? So if you're spending time with your people and then all of a sudden, six months later, they walk out of the room and they leave, they just left. And sometimes they leave with your customers. So when you get an understanding of how much it costs you to train people properly, hire the right ones. Or the next thing you know, you're going to be losing money. And that's one of my biggest concerns as far as losing money. When you look at the game, 46% of the employees voluntarily quit their jobs because they weren't, didn't feel appreciated. Didn't feel appreciated. Attaboys, way to go. Thank you very much. I really appreciate what you've done. But we forget about it. We get so caught up in the day-to-day. The business, the payroll, and all the things, the taxes, the government, I mean, health care. I mean, my insurance agent calls me up, what, two months ago. Says, well, okay, the new premiums are out. Really? How much higher? Just 22% higher. Really? Just 22% higher. And you don't get to keep the same plan. Yay. All right, your deductible is going to go up a little bit more. Thank you, Jesus, okay? You know, we're just down like going, is there anything else you can share? They didn't cancel you. Yes, okay, where do I sign, all right? It's like, this is exciting. When you look at it, you start thinking about voluntarily quit their jobs. You start thinking about all the things that you're putting up with, but we don't. We forget to give them the attaboys, and the words are free. See, in a world of international competition, constantly changing technology, instant global communication, the certainty of uncertainty, how do you do what? Ensure your success. You've heard it a million times, folks. It's a very simple three-letter word. Wow, I'm impressed. Who are you guys? Because if you don't make them say, wow, they can go anywhere on you. There's a whole lot of competition out there. But what you need to do is define wow. You need to ask your customer, what is wow? What are you looking for? 24-7, be able to call me on a Saturday, be able to do this, do that. They've got to understand or you've got to understand what wow is. That's my concern because the next thing you know, your competitor is going to understand that and they're going to take it away from you. They appreciate the wow factor. So when you go in and you sit down with your people and you sit down with your clients, you ask them, what do you expect of us? And write it down. Write it down. I asked Robin a very simple question, but the most critical question of my program. What is it you want me to accomplish? And then I start writing. I got every cotton-picking thing she said. I write it all down, and I keep it. I got the notebooks there. They used to call me notebook. I still write it down. Then I put it on the computer. Why? Because it's her program, not mine. It's got to be delivered to you guys. It's their company, not yours. So what are they expecting? What are they looking for? That's my concern. Zappos. You start thinking about it, a ridiculous business. If you have not bought the book, Delivering Happiness, get it. Why? Because here's a company that sells shoes online. That's the dumbest business plan I've ever heard of in my life. You got to try the things on. You got to try shoes on. No, we're going to sell them online. They go from zero to a billion in 10 years. Amazon bought them. By the way, when they hire somebody, now this is amazing. When they, when they hire anybody, doesn't matter if they're a CSR, customer service rep, 
or a senior vice president that's going to be new to the company or an attorney, everyone they hire goes through the same four weeks of training. Everybody. And at the end of every week, they offer anybody in the room $2,000 to quit. You don't like it here? Here's $2,000. Please leave. Why? They said, we don't want anybody here that doesn't want to be here that doesn't understand our culture, and it would save us a fortune by giving them the $2,000. Less than 1% take the money. Everybody understands the culture, and the reason why they have that senior vice president or that attorney or that other person going through the same four weeks of training, they want to, them to understand what makes this company tick, that phone. And that industry, ladies and gentlemen, you're supposed, what do they do when you're talk, talking on a phone? You're supposed to get them off the phone, right, in a call center. Isn't that the rule? The faster you can get them off the phone, the more money that you'll make. That's the rule in call centers. The longest call in Zappos has been six hours. A six-hour phone call for an order. Their rule is, as long as we're talking to the customer on the phone and servicing the customer, we're doing what? Advertising. Making our companies look better. And by the way, the president of Zappos was at a buying program in, the, in Vegas. And he was talking, a bunch of his vendors were sitting in their hotel room about 12.30 at night. And they heard about his customer service thing. And he said, there's no way your people are going to do it all the time. He said, call them. We said, what do you mean call? He said, go ahead, just call them. Don't tell them I'm here. They said, and do what? And one guy said, oh, I know. You're, they supposedly help you about anything. We'll order pizza. They're in Vegas at 1230 at night. All their vendors sitting around the room. They push the speakerphone. They call Zappos the sales line. And they said, we're in Las Vegas. It's about 1230 at night. We're at a convention. We can't find pizza that'll be delivered to our hotel. We need your help. The person on the other end of the phone goes, just a moment, please. Doesn't go, what? You call Zappos for shoes and everything else? Just goes, just a moment, please. Takes about two minutes and comes back. Gives them a list of three different pizza places they can call that deliver 24 hours a day. And their statement was, here you go. And by the way, if you'd ever like to buy shoes, give us a call. They're sitting there going, who are you guys? That's the culture. The culture is we're going to help you. You're saying you're nuts. By the way, folks, if someone calls you up and asks you about a service in a computer business that you don't do, and you say, I don't do that? We never said that. We said, we'll get back to you. I know somebody who does. Really? That way they call us every time. And then all of a sudden when they call us and we do do that, we do that. All right? And that's what you've got to understand. Delivering happiness, and that's what they deliver. That's their core competence. By the way, they changed their business plan four times. Four times, but they became a billion-dollar company. There's, wow. You people have great attitudes. Service is always quick. Everyone is so polite. Your prices are competitive. You are so knowledgeable. You really are available 24-7. You explain things in layman's terms where I can understand them. Those are generic, but they make sense. Wow, who are you guys? I'm impressed. One of my clients is a corrugated box manufacturer. Not real exciting. Except they specialize in delivering tough orders. They haven't missed a deadline in 10 years. They're so good at what they do. They write on their invoice, date you requested it, date we delivered it, difference between the two. How would you like to be the person that company caused them to miss? You want to be that person? By the way, they don't fire them, they kill them. <laughs> Put them in a corrugated box, ship that puppy right on out of there, okay? <laughs> See, they understand that the moment they drop down to miss, that's it. That's it, it goes back to zero. So they get everybody in the organization down upon it to help make that deadline. Don't promise if you can't deliver. And that's what your people have got to appreciate. Another one of my clients, Viking Freight. 13,000 shipments per day, 252 workdays per year, 3,276,000 shipments, 99.2% delivered on time. They called me up and they said, make us great. I said, make you what? I said, what? You want it? You're 99.2%. What am I going to talk about? 0.8? You dropped the ball with 0.8. Yeehaw. And then I said, wait a second, y'all are in California. You just filled up the Rose Bowl and Staples Coliseum with people that don't like you. And then they had a visual. And by the way, when people don't like you, what do they do? Share. How many of y'all use email? <laughs> Silly question in this room, all right? How many of y'all have your group? Oh, all of a sudden you get an email and you see that and you go, oh, I need to share that with my group. <laughs> just went to 80 people. 80 of your closest, dearest, nearest friends and what? Customers or clients or just friends. It just, boom. Next thing you know, the same thing happens with you. Your computer company did something wrong, they send it. Don't do business with them. Don't do business with them. Don't do business with you. You're going, how in the world did everybody find out? How good are they? Viking Freight got bought by FedEx when they got in the freight business. They went out and bought the best of the best. They bought the best of the best, and then Viking shared with FedEx about me, and the next thing you know, I'm doing programs for FedEx all over the country. I end up back in California. 
I said, hey, guys, how's the 99.2 now that you're bought by FedEx? They said, oh, we're not there anymore. Really? What happened? We're 99.6. Point two wasn't good enough for FedEx. I said, by the way, he said, you know what was amazing? When we painted the trucks, they came out with color swatches to make sure they were perfectly matched. Every aspect of what we do, it wasn't good enough. And that's what you've got to appreciate. I, in fact, I'll say, you'll love this. I was going to do the program for Segway in California, I mean for Viking Freight in, in California. I have a client that sends me a package every Saturday, FedEx package every Saturday for, for the last 15 years. I, you know, sometimes it's got one sheet of paper in there. I said, fax it to me, email it to me. Nope, FedEx. And, my, and FedEx loves it. You know, <laughs> this is ridiculous. I got to know my FedEx guy really good. So what does he do every time he shows up? He gives me one paper. And my office is in my home because I travel so much, so I want it right there, and I've got a wing, and it's the, all the offices in there. And so I'm sitting there, and, and what I did is I figured I'm going to have some fun. It's about four weeks before the program, so I go out there and I move my paper, kind of hide it a little bit. He gets out of the truck, and he's like, and I'm watching him. He goes, oh, there it is. Picks it up, comes up, hands me the package. Good morning, Mr. Stevens. It's good to see you. Next, day, I hide it a little, next week, I hide it a little bit better. The third week, I just about buried the sucker, okay? I mean, he's out there, and he's like, he's looking under the thing. What the heck? I mean, he's all, and then all of a sudden, he finds it. He goes, yes! All right? And he's walking up, and as he's walking up, I open the door, and he says, you've been hiding it. <laughs> Haven't you? And I said, yeah. He said, why? I said, I'm talking to your company next week, about 2,500 executives, and I'm going to tell them about you, Steve. I never told you to get my paper. That's just who you are. That's what makes you special. I never told you to get my paper, and you didn't give up. You got it. You'd probably knock on that door and say, they didn't deliver your paper, did Mr. Stevenson? Let me call them for you, okay? <laughs> I mean, amazing. That's wow, folks. That's the culture. The purple promise at FedEx, they live it. We have to make sure the customer is fully satisfied at every point where he or she comes in contact. At every point. That means when your people are out there selling, that's when you call them on the phone, that's when you're dealing with accounting, every aspect of what you do. And they understand that. That's what's going to differentiate you. Oh, how you doing? You scared me to death. <laughs> All right. I turned around and went, oh, God, it's time to get off. <laughs> you know, she's going to take me down. I don't, want to, I don't want to upset the phone guy. He's too big. All right. That's what we're looking for. Look at your competition. Where are you? Now, how do you differentiate yourself? It's the wow factor, folks. You must be doing something pretty special. To have someone tattoo, what, their logo on your body part. I mean, I, just, I love that, all right? I'm doing a program for Harley Davidson. 11,000 dealers in the audience. 11,000 dealers. And by the way, that's nothing compared to where they put some of those little tattoos. It's an amazing thing. And they take umbrage with what's going on. When you look at how good they are and what they do and how special, you must be doing something right when you throw a rally and that many people show up. You must be doing something right when you have 900,000 people getting their monthly magazine. That's what you've got to appreciate. Doing something right, it's not a, what, a motorcycle, folks. It is a way of life. And that's what you've got to appreciate with your company. Wow, not oh. How many of y'all ever done business someone made you say oh? Oh is a bad word, folks. When you look at O, oh, look at O. Oh, your people were rude. I always get you, anybody on the phone. I can't. You, you didn't back up my system. My system crashed again. You billed me incorrectly. You said you would, but you didn't. How many O's to take to lose a customer? One. You've been doing a good job for the last 15 years. The next thing you know, you get an O and they go, next. And that's what you've got to appreciate. And by the way, folks, that's what we're concerned about. We've got to what? We cannot become what we need to be by remaining what we are. We've always got to raise it and step up the bar or we're gone. That's the purple promise. What you do, I call it customer retention day. We did it twice a year. Twice a year, folks, this is one of my secrets. And I learned it from somebody else, just like you guys are here learning it from other people. My secret was very simply this. We asked this question twice a year. We would walk into our customer's office. We say, in a perfect world, if we could provide you perfect service, what are we not providing you? And shut up. Whatever it was, we'd write it down, try and figure out if we could do that. If we couldn't do it, we'd find someone that could. See, we knew that they would leave and go get somebody else if we weren't providing because a lot of people don't complain. They just go hire somebody else. In a perfect world, if we could provide you perfect service, what are we not providing you? It'll also help you in strategic planning of other things that you can do for them. Or you can do what? Work with another company in conjunction that will solve those problems. The day we forget we're in business for the customer is the day we start going out of business. You're there for them. They're not there for you. And your people have got to understand that. See, Viking Freights, that's their motto. Easy to do business with. Pick up the phone, easy to do business with. Call them, easy to do business with. Every aspect of what they do, easy to do business with. That was their motto. 
And that's what you've got to appreciate. That's what we're looking for. The fast track of success is very simply that three-letter word. Wow, you better go find out what makes your customer say it. Ask them. They'll tell you, this is what I'm expecting. And then the next thing you know, you get better. Because if I share anything with you today, this is the most important I'm going to share you. See, to me, business is very simply this. Life is very simply this. Showtime. Who would you rather do business with, someone in a good mood or bad? How many of y'all want to do business with someone in a bad mood? Show of hands. Nobody. You want to do business with someone in a good mood? But let's do a litmus test on you. Pull somebody aside that will give you an honest answer and ask them this question. In a, if it added up to 100%, how much time in a good mood, how much time in a bad mood? How much time in a bad mood? And listen to what they say. Gosh, Rob, you never smile. You're always carrying the weight of the company on your shoulders. You're always in a bad mood. What did they just say? 80% of the time, you're doing business with someone you wouldn't want to do business with. Folks, I'll give you an example of my business. I mean, you do this all over the world, you're going to get sick. And I know when I go out of the country, don't drink the water, don't, if they cooked it in water, don't, I, I know the rules. And I was, I was in Mexico and somehow I got sick. I don't know what the deal, I mean, it was me and the porcelain thing for about nine hours. I mean, the next morning I get up, the meeting planner looks at me, she goes, you look terrible. I said, you have no idea how I feel. She said, Rob, there's 3,000 people out there. You've got to go on. I said, I will. She said, how? I said, I drank a gallon of this. I'm not going to throw up. I said, I also drank a gallon of this. I don't think I'm ever going to go again. <laughs> I said, I think I've resolved that. And the next thing you know, they introduce you, and it's what? Showtime. Don't walk around and tell your people they need to smile. You walk around and say, showtime. What? Showtime. That's every aspect. Oh, you need to smile. You need to be in a better mood. By the way, so do you. My people understood it's one thing and one thing only. As soon as they pick up the phone, as soon as they see the customer, by the way, as soon as they walk into somebody else's office, it was showtime. You know what I had on my door? I had a plaque that said, don't ever walk into my office with a complaint, ever, unless you got a suggestion. You got a suggestion? We're going to go work on it. And all of a sudden, we got to understand how you're going to change the difference, learn from some people. Disney? Phenomenal company. Employees are cast members. Customers are guests. A crowd is an audience. A work shift is a performance. A job is a part. A job description is a script. A uniform is a costume. The personnel department is casting. Being on duty is on stage. Being off duty is backstage. I saw a lot of people walking in here with your company name on your chest. Congratulations. By the way, that is your costume. And you put it on and it is what? Showtime. And Disney? That's the, that's, that is it, pure and simple. As soon as you put on the costume, you become the character no matter where you are. 60 Minutes heard that, and they said, you can't do it all the time. Disney got cocky. They said, bring it on. They said, what do you mean you bring it on? Set up your cameras anywhere. Well, they're down there in the locker room with hidden cameras. Guy's down there putting on the goofy outfit, talking to his buddy. And then he says, I got to put on the head, which is goofy language for I can no longer talk. The guy puts on the head. Folks, it's 200 yards down a hallway, up a stairway, across a parking lot, move a wall before you ever see a customer. And what's this fool doing? He's going down the hallway going, loo, 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 loo. <laughs> There's no one there. You can look down the entire hallway. Loo, 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 loo. Why? Because he knows the rule. Just as soon as you drop the ball, just as soon as you forget some kid's running up to his mom going, Bob, Bob, Goofy was smoking a cigarette. And it's forever gone. I mean, get the visual out in the park. Goofy looks down at his watch. Oh, it's break time. Pops the head. Sticks it under his arm. Beat it, kid. I'm on break. <laughs> no, ladies and gentlemen, we're never on break. And especially who? You. You want them in a good mood? You be in a good mood. You want them early? You be early. You want to be late? You be. You, you want them late? You be late. You be there with them. That's what the game is about. Showtime in every aspect of what you do. Don't tell them to smile. Let them understand why they're there. As soon as they put on that T-shirt, they understand this is why we're here for the customer, and no one else. And then all of a sudden we get better because what's it called? A moment of truth. See, a moment of truth is any time you come in contact with any aspect of your company. Anytime they come in contact with any aspect of your company and they use that to judge the quality of service that you're providing. Who is your company? The person that I'm dealing with at that exact moment. You don't think so? You have any idea how many hotels I'm in in a year? You do this all over the world. You live customer service the moment you walk in the door. And I walked into the hotel. And I knew the next day I was going to be on stage early. So I asked the young lady behind the desk, ma'am, when can I get coffee in your hotel? And she very politely looked at me and she said, sir, you can't get coffee in our hotel before 7. Oh. I said, that's probably when room service opens up. I said, but you don't understand something. I'm going to be on stage about 7.30, so I need to have coffee about 5. How can I get coffee about 5? And she very politely looked at me and said, sir, in our hotel, you can't get it before 7. 
Now I realize I'm dealing with what? An idiot. I figured I'm going to have to broach this from a different direction. I said, hang on one second. I said, if I check in your hotel at 3 o'clock in the morning, do you have somebody behind the desk? Boy, did she take umbrage with that. She says, sir, this is an international hotel. We have somebody behind our desk all the time. I said, great. You got somebody behind the desk at 3 o'clock in the morning? Yes. I said, at 3 o'clock in the morning, they're drinking coffee. I said, in fact, behind the wall right there, you probably have your own machine. She said, well, come to think of it, we do. I said, not a problem. This is what's going to go down tomorrow morning. I said, tomorrow morning about 5 o'clock, I'm going to get up. I'm going to take the two mugs down to my room. I'm going to bring them downstairs. I'm going to lay them on the counter. You're going to fill them up with coffee. I'll pay you $5 a mug. I just want coffee. And then she gives me the finger. Yes, 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 yes. The finger is a very important communication device in this world. Your name is Matt. Matt, when you have the finger in your face, don't you understand things a whole lot better? She says, sir, let me make this perfectly clear. You can't get coffee in our hotel for seven. What don't you understand about that? Now I'm a highly educated customer. On what? A mission. <laughs> How many of y'all have ever met her? Oh, they're abundant in America today. So what do they do? The next morning I get up. I put on jeans and a t-shirt. I don't comb the hair. I figure let's go make a visual, okay? <laughs> Envision me going across the lobby of this beautiful hotel. Jeans, t-shirt, hair on a skew. I pass them all. I walk into the kitchen area. God looks at me and goes, who are you? I said, don't worry about it. He says, what do you want? I said, Coffee. He said, well, sir, I happen to be responsible for the coffee. I said, great, let's go. And hotels this big, they're not small machines, they're large. I walk up to the coffee machine, I'm like, Nirvana. <laughs> he says, how many cups do you want? I said, six. <laughs> he said, six? Dude, you really love your coffee. I said, no, two are for me, four for the front desk. <laughs> he said, what? I said, you don't want to go there, son. Envision me going across the lobby of this beautiful hotel, jeans, t-shirt, hair on a skew, I pass them all. I lay four cups down, and what do I say? Tell Mary you can get coffee before sitting in this stupid hotel. <laughs> Thank you. Why don't I tell you the story? Y'all get ready to have a conference next year. Robin calls me up and says, Rob, we're thinking about doing it at the hotel. Should we go? What do I say? No. How many people I do business with? One. But I learned a long time ago, folks, it rolls downhill. Management evidently didn't understand that the gatekeeper of their organization was the person at that hotel who should have said, when would you like coffee? That also does not mean the customer's always right. Sometimes they request things of us that we don't do, and we need to say, we don't do that. We'll help you find somebody else to do. But if I'm not mistaken, it's a hotel, you got coffee, figure it out. Why? Because of that rule right there, folks. The 816 rule. You do a good job, they'll tell eight. You do a bad job, they'll warn 16. But they warn them about your company. You don't think so? How many of you have ever gone to a restaurant and gotten bad service? Show of hands. Your name, sir, is? David. David, if I asked you, should I go to that restaurant, what would you say? And you'd tell me the name of the restaurant, wouldn't you? You wouldn't say, don't go to table number 12 and get Bill. You'll say, don't go to that restaurant, wouldn't you? Table 12, Bill was the problem. And that's exactly what happens to your company. They won't say, Bill, Mary, Jane, or Sue. They'll say, don't you do business with that computer company. But Bill, Mary, Jane, or Sue were the person that blew it. That's what your people have got to understand. Everybody in your organization is a family protecting everybody else. It's, I got your back. And then the next thing you know, we get better at what we're doing. That's my concern, ladies and gentlemen. In every aspect of what we did, we always remember it's MOTs. Moments of truth. Your people have got to know every moment of truth you have with the customer. All the way down to accounting. If someone's not paying the bill, they can't be rude. You've got to call them up and figure out ways that you can help them. There's got to be a smile on that phone. I don't, well, I'm not in sales. I'm in accounting. Go hire somebody else. Get everybody in that kind of mood, and the next thing you know, your organization soars. And that's what we're looking for. See, what you're looking for is ideas. Ideas, folks. So that's what it's looking for. And let me give an example of a strategic planning session. I'm doing one for a Fortune 100 company. I call them up and say, tell me who's coming, how long they've been with the organization. 20 years, 30 years, 25 years, 17 years, no young ones. I said, you don't have any young people in the meeting. Rob, this is a Fortune 100 company. We're not going to have young people in the meeting. I said, if I'm doing the program, you're going to have young people in the meeting. They said, why? I said, the guy that's been there for 25 years, when he opens his mouth, the one that's been there for 30 can finish the stupid sentence. You've been sharing the same stuff over and over again, back and forth, bantering the same stuff. I want some new, fresh ideas. She said, that's not going to work. I said, what do you mean it's not going to work? Well, we have this guy. I said, who? She said, I'm not going to tell you. She said, but I have an idea. I said, okay. So I show up. 
Folks, it's a Fortune 100 company. It's an absolutely incredible room. All the graphics and all the electronics and beautiful tables and chairs and everything else. And at everybody's seat, there's a high-pressure water gun. Squirt gun. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've never had squirt guns in a strategic planning session, ever. I looked at her and I said, what's the deal? She said, Rob, just listen to what I'm going to say. She says, so she stands up in front of everybody. She says, you know, Mr. Stevenson's here to get some ideas. She says, but you know what? He loves to have fun in his programs, and there's people in this room that are going to shoot down ideas. I've seen it a lot, and we don't want ideas shot down. So if you shoot down an idea, we're going to shoot you down. If anybody shoots somebody's idea down here, I want you to pick up your squirt gun and shoot them. I'm going, far out. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. And I'm going, okay, let's go with it. So I'm into the program about 20 minutes, and all of a sudden this young man stands up. He's got an idea. I don't know if it's a good idea or a bad idea, but he's got an idea, and he's proud about it. He stands up and shares the idea. After he finishes the idea, up he popped. I didn't know who he was, but I did now. This man sliced him, diced him, and humiliated him in front of everybody. I mean, he just trashed this kid. The young man just fell in his seat, just plopped, humiliated. Well, the slicer and dicer didn't realize while he was doing it, she was pumping her gun. She had it underneath the table getting full power, okay? As soon as he finished, she stood up and shot him. I mean, he's like, boom. And as soon as she shot him, eight other people are like, we can really do this. So they picked up their gun, and they, he's like, what, 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 you know? And in unison, they said, sit down. This went on all day long. He'd stand up, they'd shoot him. He'd stand up. One time, he did not say a word, and someone shot him. <laughs> someone had the idea, and they just pounded it. He said, what was that all about? They said, you were thinking it. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, at the end of the meeting, he stood up. I'm like going, whoa. He said, I'd like to share something. I'm like going, oh. You could have, by the way, you could have identified him by the garden hose. He was so wet. All right? <laughs> he said, I stand here before you as the perfect example of what's been wrong with our company. Really? He said, I thought it was my, idea to, my, my job to shoot down ideas to protect us. He said, today I found out my job is to listen to ideas to find out what might be right with them, even if it's only a portion. Not to shoot them down, but to figure out what we could use to get better. Folks, your young ones are out there. Listen to them. I don't care if they've been there for a day. And by the way, we, had, we did have one rule. When we hired them, we, gave, we, had, we had a three-month rule. The rule was shut up, don't talk for three months. All right? Let us teach you. Let us teach you everything that we can teach you. And then after three months, we brought them in and we said, what's the stupidest thing we're doing here? And then we shut up and listened because they go, well, you doing, why are you doing this? And why are you doing that? Because they were fresh. They hadn't been shot down so many times. And by the way, a lot of times they won't share it with you because you're what? The boss. You're the one signing the check. They're scared to death of you. No, they can't be scared to death of you. 500 CEOs were queried with this question. Who took the best advantage of change in your industry over the past 10 years? Newcomers, traditional competition, or your own company? What'd they say? Newcomers. Then they asked them this question. Had they done it by what? Executing better or changing the rules? What did they say? Changing the rules. Changing the rules, folks. One of my clients is the San Diego Building Association. They sponsored the International Association of Builders, thousands of builders from all over the world. They wanted to do something amazing, something bizarre. They decided to build a house in less than four hours, using traditional methods with the code people there on videotape. That's absurd, you can't do that. Well, first of all, if you're gonna attempt it, you better have some competition, and they did. And right out of the box, they had a problem. How do you get cement to dry in minutes? They figured it out. And then they had to do what? They had to break everything down in subtasks, carry them out in parallel. So exactly what did that mean? Well, one was laying the foundation, another was framing the walls, another was building the roof. They took hundreds of workers, nearly choreographed everything that went on, and they built a three-bedroom bungalow complete with landscaping in less than three hours, according to code, with the code people there on videotape. You're saying that's impossible. They did it. In fact, one of my clients is Tennessee Valley Authority. They got the video to all their people, and they've used it to change things within their organization, to look at it from a different perspective. A different perspective, doing the same thing the same way and expecting a different outcome. You're listening to people here to get different ideas. You say, well, that won't work. Maybe it will. A different perspective, folks, that's what you've got to identify. By the way, when you look at it, start changing the rules. You can go to their website, and you can buy the DVD and share it with your people. San Diego Building Association is called the Three Hour House. I wrote the book, How to Soar Like an Eagle in a World Full of Turkeys. Why? To be negative? No, to be positive. But I learned a long time ago there's an abundance of turkeys in this world. How many of y'all have ever been associated with, work with one, or live with one? Show of hands. If you didn't raise your hand, you're lying. I got 86 examples in the book. To give an example of a turkey, bosses or associates taking credit for your work. Turkey. 
Another type of turkey, a person who parks in handicap and isn't handicapped. Turkey. I've never parked in handicap. Well, I always thought God would look down and go, you want it? You got it. <laughs> Forever. That'll change your attitude of pulling in. What's another type of turkey? That person who writes a check in the cash only line. And sometimes you open your mouth and speak and you instantly become a turkey. We've all done it. I mean, I've done it hundreds of times. You don't think so? I mean, you know, I mean, give an example. It's a person who said he smoked marijuana but never inhaled. And by the way, that's not political. Okay, I had a person walk up to the book sign. She said, oh, that was political. I said, no, it was a fact. She said, well, you need to share. And I went, that's a good point. So let's go to the other side of the fence. He said that. Well, this person said they want the federal government controlling Social Security like it's some kind of federal program. It is, George. Oh, shucks. <laughs> Insert foot. We all do it, folks. You don't think so? Ask your significant other if you've ever been a turkey. It's amazing what they'll tell you about. Things that you forgot a long time ago, okay? We've all done it, folks, and you've got to understand you've got to deal with them. It's also a person organizations think they're going to succeed next year because of what you did last. And that's my concern, folks. You've got to understand. You've got to learn to deal with them. And by the way, you might have some customers that are turkeys, and they sign the check. So learn how to deal with them and have your people do the same thing. Because what you have to appreciate, if you don't like change, you're going to hate extinction. <laughs> oh, yeah, especially in your industry. I mean, it is out there, and it's abundant out there, folks. Let me give an example. I'd like everybody in the room, fold your hands like you're going to pray. Fold your hands, okay? How many got your right thumb over your left? Show of hands. How many got your left thumb over your right? Come on, let me give you some, I mean, some serious research. I don't have a clue why. Okay, I've done some extensive research. I ain't got a clue. Okay, I, I, by the way, if you ask your parents, if I asked my mom, how'd you do that? And she showed me, it might have been the mirror. She might have been on the other side, and I've been doing exactly the opposite. But that's not what I'm trying to show you. What I want everybody to do, everybody had your left thumb over your right or your right thumb over your left, change. Is that not disgusting? I mean, that's like, oh, that, oh, that, that, yeah, she, that's, that's just wrong. Okay, you just don't do it that way. Next time you change the policy, your people are thinking the same thing. But if you did it that way for six months, it'd be a slam dunk. That's what change is all about, folks, but people don't appreciate it. So when you're talking about a policy or a procedure, tell your people, we need to change, we need to get better, that's okay. It's going to feel a little bit different for a while. I have no problem with that. Put it up when you look at as far as what's going on, as far as that slide's concerned. No, oh, there we go. We fight change. And that's the only constant that we have, folks, and that's what my concern is. Anybody know who invented the digital watch? The Swiss. The watchmakers of the world invented the digital watch. They took it to the National Association of Swiss Watchmakers. 65,000 of them. They said, what do you think? Never sell. Why? It doesn't have a mainspring. Everybody knows a watch has got to have a mainspring. A watch has had a mainspring since its inception. So 65,000 watchmakers concurred. So they took it to the International Association of Watchmakers, unpatented, unprotected. Why? Because it was a gimmick. It was never going to sell. A group of gentlemen walked up to the digital watch and they only had two words to say. They looked down and they went, a uh, soul. <laughs> Very interesting watch. Have no mainspring to break. Keep perfect time. We sell millions. And they did. Ten years later, there were 55,000 less watchmakers in Switzerland. Their paradigm is the watch has got to have a mainspring. How many of y'all have ever seen your mainspring? I've never seen my mainspring. I don't care if there's a rat in the sucker, long as the rat's on time. But to the watchman, it's got to have a mainspring. It's got to have a mainspring. It's always had a mainspring. By the way, not having a mainspring is one less thing to break. You want to cause your company to fail? Say these words. That's the way we've always done it. No, that's one reason why you're here, to find out new and different ways to do it. Ted Turner took it to CNN, took CNN to every major network in the United States. ABC, CBS, and NBC had a 92% market share. They threw them out. They said, get out of here, you stupid billboard salesman. Who wants to listen to news 24 hours a day? That is a stupid idea. He walked up on a silver platter and he only wanted to participate and they kicked him out. He sold that stupid idea for $7 billion. I'll give you another rule about change. The idea that gets the most resistance is probably a pretty good idea. More U.S. workers are now employed by women-owned companies and entire Fortune 500 combined. Oh, how things change. And when you look at change, the rate of change in the United States is such that a high new technology is produced in the marketplace every 17 seconds. That's only three per minute, 200 per hour, 5,000 per day. Some of you look at that slide and say, yeah, it's going to get worse too. Others you look at it and say, no, it's going to get better. We're going to be able to utilize this to make our job simpler. And that's the way you need to look at it. I mean, think about computers. The most three, recent $300 computer video game, Nintendo One, has more computer power than the $20 million supercomputer that existed in the Pentagon 25 years ago. I mean, that's amazing. 
But what's even more amazing about technology and computers, they're 8,000 times less expensive than they were 30 years ago. Now, that's amazing. But what would be more amazing if the automotive industry had kept up? Uh, yeah. yeah, it means you could buy a Lexus for two bucks. <laughs> it would go the speed of sound, you could go 600 miles in a thimble of gas. I don't think they kept up. And that's what we, excuse me, when we start looking at, when we start looking at change, what do we start talking about? It's the only constant that's out there. So, so do what? Learn how to handle it or it's going to handle you. And then all of a sudden when you think about it, sometimes you're going to have something that you can't really change. It just happens. My wife and I got married. Um, we got married very late in life and she got pregnant and her daddy died. And at four months, she lost that baby. She got pregnant two more times and she lost those in the first trimester. And then she got pregnant one more time and her mother died of brain cancer and she lost that baby at seven months. We never thought we were going to have children. And then all of a sudden, boom, Tyler. And then on that day right there, when he was nine years old, I got a phone call. Your son has juvenile diabetes. I have no idea what that means. They bring you in there, and they hand you an orange, they give you syringes, you start filling the thing with the insulin, and they say, this is what you're going to be doing. I, yeah, I have no idea. I hate diabetes, folks. There's a lot of people out there that have type 2. Type 1 is just your, your pancreas just shuts down. You got unlucky. And so all of a sudden, they, we're trying to find out what we're supposed to be doing, and your life instantly changes. And they said, this is going to do this, and you're going to do this, you're going to do this, and then things are going to go bad. Everything is going to go bad. How will we know? You'll know. We started testing his blood 20 times a day giving them all kinds of shots. And then they walk up and they hand us a $7,000 machine. They said, here, we want you to hook this up to your son with a tether and stick an, an infusion set in his side and he'll, that'll be his, his pancreas. And, and I remember one day a kid at school grabbed it and jerked it off of his body and ran around the playground yelling, I have this pancreas. And I remember when I told my son got it, I said, Bubba, you don't have diabetes. We got diabetes. He said, what do you mean, Dad? I said, whatever you can't do, I can't do. You can't eat it, I can't eat it. You can't drink it, I can't. We're going to do this together. You got it during the daytime, I got it at night. And we had a phenomenal endocrinologist, and she said he can do anything, and he wanted to play ball. So we learned how to play basketball. And the problem with basketball is when you go out there and play, folks, uh, your, ins your insulin's going to go highs and lows while you're out there, and also at night, it's going to crash and burn. So I would check his blood every hour and a half. I'd put a clock on my chest, and every hour and a half, I'd get up and go check his blood. And I remember one night, I got real good at it. One night, he woke up. He woke up, and he looked at me, and he said, thanks, Dad. I said, for what, Bubba? He said, for, for, being, for, for checking my blood. Well, I said, well, that's my job. I said, you got daytime, I got nighttime. And that's just the way it is. And by the way, I, I always ask him why I love playing ball. And he said, you know, Dad, that's the only place I'm normal. He said, I can take my pump off and I can put it down. And when I'm out there, I'm normal. And all of a sudden, things got pretty good. His junior year, he had 17 offers to go to elite camps in basketball. Last game of the season, blew his ACL. Cracked his kneecap, tore his meniscus. He's sitting there the day after surgery on the sofa. He has morphine going into his knee. He has his insulin pump on. He has another thing going to it wrapped around him. He's got tubes all over his body. And I walk into his room and I said, how are we doing? He said, okay, what's the plan? I said, excuse me? You just said, he said, no, we got to have a plan. And I said, uh, okay, we'll have a plan. You know, the guy said he could fix my knee and I'd be okay. And I said, well, this is the plan then. So we sat down right there and figured out a plan right there on the spot. You got a plan in the book, ladies and gentlemen. My 16-year-old is telling me we got to have a plan. And we had a plan and we followed it. After he went through rehab, he told him I want to go another month. And he went another month. He didn't get to go to any elite camp, so all the colleges went away for a while. And how did he do? He was a McDonald's All-American nominee that year. Averaged 18 points, dunked it all the time, played real good. He handled his every day. You had a man on this stage last night that was three foot tall that said, it's a burden or a gift. There are people in this room that have had all kinds of problems, a whole lot more than that. But my son is my inspiration. He taught me that you got to have a plan in everything that you do. But more importantly, my boy taught me you got to follow it. And he did. And by the way, he's doing just fine. So when you start looking at what you need to do, share the burdens, ladies and gentlemen, but then make it a gift. Learn from the people that are out there because you've got some fancy ones that are out here telling you about it. But you've got to believe because then when you start to believe, you get better. Never let the setbacks of problems or adversity keep you down. That's my deal. When you look at how you're going to do it, this is written on a tomb of an Anglican bishop, and I'd like to share it with you because it's going to help you get better at what you do. It says, when I was young and free and my imagination had no limits, I dreamed of changing the world. As I grew older and wiser, I discovered the world would not change, so I shortened my sight somewhat and decided to change only my country. But it too seemed immovable. 
As I grew into my twilight years in one last desperate attempt, I settled for changing only my family, those closest to me. But alas, they would have none of it. And now as I lie on my deathbed, I suddenly realize if I'd only changed myself first, then by my example, I would have changed my family. From their inspiration and encouragement, I would have been able to better my country, and who knows, I may have even changed the world. You want to change your people? Change you. Change you, folks. So many people are out there pointing fingers. Do this, do that, do this, do that. No, folks, change you. And the next thing you know, they'll change. And you, you make it happen because that's what we're looking for. The world is choices. You don't think it's choices? You better start thinking. Starbucks gives you coffee 19,000 different ways, not counting the five different types of what? Milk that you can put in it. Why? Because customers demand it. you got to have choices. Tropicana, just two types of orange juices 10 years ago. Now they sell 24. Customers demand it. Arby started in 1964 with one roast beef sandwich. Now they have over 30. Most of them are not roast beef. Customers demand it. You look at it, 70% of the restaurant owners customized their orders in 2010. Customers demand choices. We've amassed a billion dollars in business over 10 years by customizing virtually every order. Panera Breads. Customers demand it. One of my favorite, Dyer's Ice Cream. This is, this is ridiculous, folks. 1977, 34 flavors, now over 250. You can go to their website and you can type in how you want your ice cream your way. Dumbest thing I ever heard. I want my ice cream this way. These stupid fools will tell you within five miles of where you're getting, there, of your house where you can get their ice cream your way. That's stupid. Half a million people went there to get it their way. When you look at choices, that's what you've got to understand. To have those choices for your client or to be able to associate with a company that will supply them so you can take them to the next level. And then you better listen to them. We're going to do a real quick listening quiz and see how good you guys are. Pay attention. How many of y'all have ever taken a listening course? Show of hands. Because it's amazing they don't teach them in college. But let's see how good you guys are. You're a bus driver and everybody on your bus is over 75 years old. There it is. It says it right there. And everybody on your bus is over 75 years old. You're going to start right there at the exit and you're going to go 20 miles east. Now remember, everybody on your bus is over 75 years old. It is a yellow school bus. There it is, right there on the list. Yellow school bus, you're going to turn your bus and go 20 miles south. Now remember, everybody on your bus is over 75 years old. It's a yellow school bus, and your school bus is 60 feet long. Then you're going to turn your bus and go 20 miles west. Now let's do it again. Everybody on your bus is over 75 years old. It's a yellow school bus, 60 feet long. Turn your bus and go 20 miles north and end up right at the X. I'm going to give it to you one more time. Everybody on your bus is over 75. It's a yellow school bus. It's 60 feet long. I don't want to hear a sound in this room, but I want everybody in this room to write down the age of the bus driver. Not a sound. How old is the bus driver? Not a sound. How many people in this room think the bus driver is over 75? Show of hands. Who's got a different answer? Yes, sir. Why? Yes, sir. First words out of my mouth. I'm going to talk real fast, but listen to what I'm going to say, ladies and gentlemen. The first words out of my mouth are, you're the bus driver. And then I said over 25 times, you can run the tape back. You're the bus driver. You're going to turn your bus. You're going to do this. You're going to go south. You're, 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 you're. And everybody, most everybody in this room missed it. Why? We don't listen. And by the way, folks, the greatest memory does not compare to the palest ink. You want to do something for your customer? Write it down. You want to do something for your people? Write it down. And by the way, why did you, why did you miss it? I don't use anything that I didn't miss. Folks, I'm a type A like you didn't figure that out. And I'm an engineer. Oh, I got the details. I got the details. I, and I went right by it. Listen to what your customers are having to say and then get them and help them get what they need. That's my concern. If I was having a meeting, and by the way, we're going to do this real quick because if I was doing a strategic planning session, these are my rules and you've got them in your book. You can see them right there, titles don't count. Phrases like, that's the way we've always done it, don't count. But if I'm doing a strategic planning session and you want to find out what's wrong with your company, write it down. Kenichi May, one of the top strategists in the world, wrote the book called The Mind of the Strategist. This is how you do it. So I'm just going to share some of the things. Take all the things that you're doing wrong, put them in one of five categories, go fix one. Now what I'm getting ready to share with you, I would do in an all-day session. But I'm just going to give you the questions. Have a meeting with your people and ask it, very simple. By the way, Walmart has a contest every year. What's the stupidest thing that we do here? And they give out prizes. They give out prizes to find out what's the stupidest thing. Their, their deal is, the idea is focus is what? Subtraction is genius. That's what we're looking for. Exercise of genius is subtraction. Addition is for the exercise of fools. What does it take to be great in your business? Write it down and make sure your people do it. Have that exercise. Ask them, what does it take? Ask your customers, what does it take? Then ask, find out where you're excelling, where you're doing okay. 
But in a strategic planning session, after we get all that stuff written down, I'm getting ready to do one next week for a Fortune 100 company. When we write that down, then we go to this one right here. Very simple, where are we falling short? That's what you need to know what you're doing wrong. Ask your people and ask your customers. Where, what are we, in a perfect world, if we can provide you perfect service, what are we not providing you? And then, why do we? Ask your people and your customers. And then the most important one, why don't we? Let them say it, not you, them. Because what you've got to appreciate, folks, is then you come down with three choices. You can't fix everything about your company. So focus on just three. And make sure they're the most important dealing with your people. That way, you'll get better at what you're doing. I just gave you a day's planning session with those simple little questions. Because involving your people in procedure changes makes them accept the change a whole lot easier. That's what it's about. And when I leave you with anything, praise in public, criticize in private. Your people make a mistake, don't ever say it in front of somebody. Don't ever say it in front of them. And make them think they can because they think they can, because they're looking for answers. They're looking for answers, folks. I'll give an example. A husband and wife get into a fight. Husband loses it. He looks at his wife and says, I don't know why God made you so beautiful and so stupid. All in the same package. She said, well, darling, that's quite simple. God made me beautiful, so you'd fall in love with me. He made me stupid, so I'd fall in love with you. <laughs> if I leave you with anything today, probably the most important thing I'm going to leave you with is that smile. As long as you, can, you have that on your face, you cannot have a bad day, and I hope you have a great one. Thank you for your time. Thank you.